All right, in this video, I want to talk about deriving the Taylor series expansion. So you may have seen uh, ways to find power series ex expansions for different functions. You may have seen geometric series um, and some def different types of series. But kind of more generically, we want to answer these two questions. So uh, which functions do have power series representations? Um, it turns out not all functions do have power series representations. And when you can find a power series representation, sometimes they're only valid for certain values of x. So this is a question we're not really going to address. What we're going to do is kind of answer the more generic question. If a function does have a power series, is there a nice procedure that we can use to find them? Okay, So we're going to address this question. And this is what the Taylor series expansion does. Um, to answer the first question, you have to use Taylor's remainder theorem, uh, typically, and you can justify it that way. So, again, I'm not going to go into depth in that, but just a heads up, you know, if you want to see that, maybe uh, look about, you know, I don't think I, at the moment, have a video of that. Um, I can't remember, but definitely in your book, look up Taylor series remainder theorem, something of that nature, and you can figure out which functions do have power series representations, how to justify it. Okay, so in this we're going to assume that a function f of x does have a power series representation. And recall a power series expansion or a power series representation. There's some little function, f of x, you know, some little nice simple formula. And it turns out we want to express it as an infinite sum, sort of an infinite polynomial. c sub 0, some constant, plus c sub 1 times x minus a to the first, plus 2 times x minus, or excuse me, c sub 2 times x minus a squared, plus c sub 3 times x minus a cubed. I'm even going to write in one more term. Uh, c sub 4 times x minus a to the fourth, and then it would just, you know, go on forever and ever and ever and ever. Okay, so this is a power series representation. And again, we say it's centered at x equals a. Again, there's geometric uh, implications about centering it at a certain value. Again, I'm not going to go into that. Um, otherwise, my video about deriving Taylor series would end up becoming a seminar on Taylor series. So I just want to talk about coming up with the formula for the moment. So we're going to assume that our function f of x does have a Taylor series expansion. And we're just going to start making some observations Okay, using derivatives, nothing deep. Okay. Um, we won't use a derivative at the beginning, but kind of notice, if I plug in the value a, which is where I'm centering it at, well, I would get c sub 0 plus, well, then if I plug a into this, uh, you know, this power series expansion, da, 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 da. if I plug a into that, what's going to happen? Well, everything else is just going to give me a bunch of zeros. We'll get c sub 1, we'll have a minus a or 0. We'll have c sub 2, a minus a, which is 0 squared, on down the line. So everything's going to cancel out except for our c sub 0. So really what this says is, it says to get your constant c sub 0, it says just take wherever you're centering it at, which is a, and plug it into your formula on the left side. Alrighty, so at least uh, we know one of our constants. And again, in this expansion, we're given a. You'll center it wherever. The x's stay in there. So the only thing we're really trying to figure out, um, the only thing that's really missing are the values of these constants. So that's our whole goal, again, is just to figure out these numbers. That's what we're trying to do. Well, hey, I've got one of them. Perfect. Um, let's make another observation here. Let's take a derivative. Well, if I take a derivative, um, our constant c sub 0 would be gone we would get c sub 1. If I take the derivative of the inside, I would just get, well, the derivative of 1x is 1. a is also a constant, so that's gone. Um, then we would get 2 times c sub 2 times x minus a to the first, and then times 1 by the chain rule. Um, we would get a 3 times c sub 3 times x minus a to the second power. And then when I take the derivative of the last term that I've got written out, we'll have 4 times c sub 4 times x minus a cubed, um, on down the line. OK, so again, let's just make the same observation. We're just going to plug in our value a. So notice if we plug a into the derivative, well, you'll be left with your constant c sub 1. But again, notice everything else. If you plug in a, we're going to get a bunch of zeros. We'll get 2 c sub 2 times 0 plus 3 c sub 3 times 0 squared, on down the line. So it says the only thing that you're going to be left with um, it says will be c1. So now I know a way to figure out, um, not only did we figure out how to figure out 
the constant, um, we figured out a way to determine c, c sub 1, and that says just take the derivative of the function and again plug in a. So perfect, I now know how to figure out two of these numbers. Okay. Well, we're just going to keep doing this forever and ever and ever uh, and try to spot a pattern. So hopefully not forever and ever and ever. So let's take a derivative again. Um, let's take the second derivative. Well, c sub 1 is going to be gone. So if you think about the chain rule, the, the 1 would come out front. I'm going to write it. So we would get 2 times 1 times c sub 2. Um, the derivative of 1x minus a, again, will just be times 1. Then we'll get uh, 3 times the 2 would come out front, c sub 3. Then we would have x minus a to the first power. And then we would get, well, chain rule, we would do 4 times 3 times c sub 4 times x minus a squared. And, you know, I certainly recognize, hey, you can multiply these things out. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to spot a pattern, okay? And a lot of times in these, it's best not to multiply things out just to see the pattern. All right, we're going to do the same thing. Notice if we plug a into our second derivative, um, we get 2 times 1 times c, c sub 2. But again, the same thing else. When I plug in a here, I'm going to get you know, 0. When I plug in a here, I'm also going to get 0. So everything's going to cancel out except for this. Again, we're trying to figure out the values for the constant, so I can just divide both sides. So it says c sub 2 would be, well, f double prime of a divided by 2 times 1. And again, now I know a way to figure out c sub 2. It says take two derivatives, plug in a, and divide it by 2 times 1. All right, so I feel like, you know, I'm on a roll here now. We're figuring out, we've got a nice clean way to figure out all of these constants. <clears throat> Let's do maybe one more, and then we're going to generalize. So there was our second derivative. I'm going to take one more derivative, so the third derivative at x. So our 2 times 1 times c sub 2, that's now gone because um, it's a constant. So we'll get, well, 3 times 2 times 1 times c sub 3. The derivative of 1x minus a would be 1 minus 0, or again, just times 1. Over here, uh, we'll have to do the chain rule. So 4 times 3. I'm going to stick the 2 inside of there. Then times our c sub 4. And then we would have x minus a to the first power. And again, we've got a bunch of other stuff after this. But make the same observation. Notice if you plug a into the third derivative, we'll get, well, 3 times 2 times 1 times c sub 3. Everything else is still going to have an x minus a. So when you plug a into everything else, you're just going to get a bunch of zeros. So again, now I've got a nice uh, clean formula to calculate c sub 3. It says just take the third derivative evaluated at a and divide it by 3 times 2 times 1. And again, the shorthand for that, 3 times 2 times 1, we just write that as 3 factorial. So recall, for example, uh, you know, for just at random, 7 factorial is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Okay, so just remember factorial notation. So um, we'll just write our, our denominator a little more compactly. And what you can do is now you can do the same thing. You can take the fourth derivative, okay, so we could take yet another derivative, plug in our value of a, and what you would notice is you're only going to be left with 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 times c sub 4. Okay, so maybe take one more derivative and check this. And again, that says that our constant c sub 4, to get that, it says, well, just take the fourth derivative of your function, plug in a, and divide that by, well, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which would be 4 factorial. In general, it's going to turn out that your constant c sub n, well, it's just going to end up being, you take the nth derivative, plug in that value a, and just like here, you know, when you're at the fourth derivative, you're dividing by four factorial. The third derivative, you're dividing by three factorial. If you're at the nth derivative, you're going to end up dividing by n factorial. So this is a uh, this is kind of mucho important. This is the way generically that we figure out our coefficients. Okay. So it really says is what we can go back and say now. So what it really says is it says that formula that we had. So f of x, it says we can write that as c sub 0 plus c1 times x minus a to the first. 
plus C2 times X minus A squared plus C3. That was our power series expansion that we assumed our function had. Well, now we can just start plugging, um, plugging our values in. It says to get C sub 0, it said, we said you just plug A into the original function. Okay. To get our value of C sub 1, C sub 1 just turned out to be the first derivative. And we can even write that as over uh, 1 factorial times x minus a to the first. And again, the same thing. We found c sub 2. What was c sub 2? It was the second derivative at a divided by, well, 2 times 1, which we can write as 2 factorial. Um, so we can now write c sub 2 as f double prime of a over 2 factorial times x minus a squared plus um, our c sub 3 term. We said that was the third derivative at a over 3 factorial times x minus a cubed. And this just keeps going on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. OK, so, um, so this is the basic idea. It says, if your function has a power series representation, we can write it as this infinite sum. But now we know a way to figure out the coefficients. We're just taking derivatives, plugging in a's, and dividing by factorials. So more compactly, we can write this formula. We can write this formula simply using summation notation as n equals 0 to infinity. Um, to get the coefficient, it says we take the nth derivative, plug in a, divide that by n factorial, and then we would have x minus a raised to the nth power. So notice everything kind of matches up. The nth derivative goes with that factorial, so three factor third derivative, three factorial, power of three. Second derivative, 2 factorial power of 2. So if you're at the nth derivative, you're going to have n factorial, and you're going to have a power of n. Um, also, one thing, too, maybe you've seen this and maybe you haven't. Um, one thing people don't like, 0 factorial is defined to equal 1. So sometimes people don't like, you know, when you plug in 0, they say, oh, 0 factorial, that you're dividing by 0. But by definition, 0 factorial equals 1. So this formula does work out. So that's the Taylor series expansion. That's where it comes from. If a function has a power, a power series expansion, um, we've now, you know, just made an observation. If you take derivatives, this is what's going to have to happen. So now we've got a nice, uh, simple way to figure out the coefficients. And nothing deep, nothing magical, but um, very clever to me and very useful. And um, I don't know, the stuff you can do with this to me is uh, it's borderline magical. I really like it. So um, I hope this makes some sense. Again, nothing heavy. You're just taking derivatives and plugging in a's, and um, that's how you get your constants. So I hope this makes some sense. Definitely in another video, I do want to address this question of, um, you know, Assuming, okay, so if a function does have a power series representation, here it is. This is how you find it. But when does it make sense to say that these are equal? Okay, so kind of in another video, you'd really have to justify justify when this happens, okay, when it is valid. Um, so we'll talk about that in another video. Also, maybe geometrically just talk about what it means to center it at different values, okay? So, all right, I hope this makes some sense. I hope this helps you out. Again, just kind of goes to show you, you know, you, you kind of sometimes see these weird formulas and they seem, um, you know, obviously they come from somewhere. People aren't just making this stuff up. But, you know, it's good to know where it comes from. Um, you know, then you're understanding it, like I say, instead of just memorizing formulas. So, all right. Um, once again, I hope it helps, and good luck out there.